Okay, so today we are going to talk about uh, Twitter's recommendation algorithm. So the talk is divided into three parts. Uh, we'll start by looking at an overview of recommendation algorithms in general. Uh, and so that so this is not uh, like recommendation algorithms are a, are a class of algorithms by itself because they have advanced so much in the last 10 to 15 years and so much research has gone into it we can't expect to cover that in uh, in this one hour talk but we are going to cover it at a very high level for those of you who are completely new to it and then we'll go into how twitter has implemented recommendation uh, in their system uh, for recommending tweets to users and in the last part of the talk we will look at uh, some of the code which they have open sourced so that would be the structure of today's talk okay so let's begin with the first part why do we need recommendation algorithms so the premise of recommendation or any recommendation system is very simple there is simply too much data out there too much information or content out there and no single person can consume all that content at the same time we don't want users to search for content that is how typically things happen on google search you want something you go to google and you search for it but is there a better way can you recommend content to users before they even explicitly search for it so that's the whole premise of recommendation systems the idea is suggest to users content which they are to, with which they are likely to be uh, engaged with so what does engagement mean uh, they can I, they, typically they would uh, like the tweet or retweet it or in the case of youtube for example they will watch the video or click the video watch the video or like the video share the video so all these are positive interactions with the content that is uh, recommended to the user now if the recommendation algorithm gets it wrong then you have the opposite problem where you know you give a wrong rec recommendation either the user doesn't click it or he gets gives a negative review so that would be an example of the recommendation algorithm not working properly so that's uh, uh, what recommendation is all about now what is the interest for obviously the interest for users is uh, clear the users without even searching for content that they might be interested in the platform recommends the content to them what what's the uh, interest for the platforms themselves why why do they want to recommend these things to the users basically they want to keep the users longer on the platform they want more user engagement and this engagement has to translate in some way towards uh, higher user retention active users and eventually to sales and ad revenues so that is uh, the uh, ultimate goal of these platforms to keep you longer on the platform and translate these uh, positive uh, interactions towards uh, dollars so that is why recommendation algorithms are very important and they are being widely used in almost every social platforms in twitter it is common that's what we are going to discuss today but in every other platform netflix uh, used it extensively and even now they are using it uh, to recommend uh, movies to users google uses it for example when you go to play store you may you might search for a certain app let's say you search for ola so immediately uh, you know according to that search uh, you will obviously get matches for ola app but if you notice it will also recommend you other apps which are closely aligned with ola for example it might recommend to you uber app or namayatri app if you are in bangalore for example so those other apps for which you did not search but the platform knows google play knows that they are all closely aligned to what you are looking for basically it knows that you are looking for some sort of an app for, to help you book taxis or book a ride in general so uh, that is why it recommends those things and uh, google play has released some numbers uh, so for example uh, it has said that you know 40% of the app installs that happen on google play come from recommendations as you can see here i have written a little bit about that likewise if we look at youtube 40% of the watch time on youtube are due to recommendations 
That means for all the videos and watch time that happen on recommendation, this is a big number, 40%. Right? So the rest, 60%, either people came directly through a link, somebody shared it, that could be a reason, or uh, people explicitly searched for it and then they stumbled across the video. So those are the other use cases, but 40% of watch time on YouTube comes from recommendations, which also is a signal that recommendations are working pretty well on YouTube. So that is uh, uh, like the fundamental idea uh, you know, of recommendations. Now, what are the different techniques of recommendations? So for this, I'll bring up a figure. This is commonly known in, uh, I mean, among uh, data scientists who have been working in this field, they know this. So recommendation systems typically fall into three categories. Sometimes people don't even look at the knowledge base categories. They only cover content based and collaborative based or they subsume this under content base. But broadly, uh, you know, there are three types of ways in which recommendation systems work or the approaches, let's say. One is content base, and all these are easy to explain with examples. So one is called content base. So let's say I am a user, I am on YouTube, and I, I'm watching a lot of uh, action movies. Now, action movies all have some sort of an attribute. First of all, they are categorized as action movies. So let's say I watch two, three action movies. Naturally, the now YouTube knows that I like action movies and it will recommend to me action movies. So this is what we call as content base. So the content, every piece of content on the platform has attributes and these attributes are either auto generated by algorithms or they can be manually uh, labeled by experts. We can also say these are metadata that comes with the data. So let's say you publish an action movie, let's say Matrix, that has an attribute saying that it's an action movie. People have other attributes as well. For example, Keanu Reeves is the actor in that and so many other attributes or it could another attribute could be director of the movie. Now, all these attributes are attributes of the content, nothing to do with the user who is watching the YouTube video. Now, based on these attributes, the platform can recommend similar content uh, that match these attributes. So if I watch a lot of movies by a certain director, then the content knows that I have a preference for this director. So then it can recommend other movies not watched, but are from this particular director. So that's the idea of content based uh, recommendation. The other broad and more popular scheme of recommendation is collaborative filtering, which is uh, extremely popular. Now, one, one thing you will notice about content based uh, recommendation is it is very easy to get stuck in a filter bubble. Suppose I watch a lot of action movies, I will never go and if I click only what is recommended by the system based on content based recommendation. I will never be presented with any content which is not uh, action based, which means I am in my own filter bubble. I will only be watching action movies. So I don't explore the rest of the videos which are there out there on YouTube. So that is kind of one of the problems with content based uh, recommendation. The other problem, of course, is that, you know, all the must be labeled or they should be uh, accurate metadata. Some of these things are rectified in collaborative filtering. So this also we can explain with an example. Suppose I watch uh, movies A and B, and uh, there is another user in the system who also watches movie, a, who has also watched movie A and B. And I have given good ranking or good comments on movies A and B. Similarly, the other user also has given good comments on movies A and B. So now the system figures out that I am very much similar or my behavior is similar to another user on the system. Now that other user has watched movie C. Now because the system already knows that you know, these two users are similar, that movie C will be recommended to me. Because we already agree on the ratings for movies A and B. So this is the idea of collaborative filtering. And there is a nice figure which also underscores this. So take this as uh, an example of collaborative filtering. So here, this is the complete catalog. Doesn't matter which platform you are on, either you are on Instagram or YouTube or Twitter. 
this is the complete catalog of course we don't have time to go or patience to look at the entire catalog but we have watched a little bit of it so these are the items which the current user has consumed and uh, he or she has liked this content now there is another bunch of users who have also liked similar items so that is why you see between this white circle and the light gray circle there is a considerable overlap that means these users are very much similar in behavior to the current user now the recommendation system which is using collaborative filtering figures this out and then it sees that there are a lot of items in this white circle which can now immediately be recommended to this user why because there is a considerable overlap the behavior of this user or the preferences of this user is very similar to these users so this content which the user has not yet watched can be recommended to this user so this is the idea of collaborative filtering okay so now let's come to the last bit which is knowledge based filtering so this is also commonly used uh, in all platforms let's come to twitter so today uh, again i went to twitter and i looked at the preferences and if you are using twitter twitter will prompt you let's say you have created a account or a feed twitter will prompt you with these kind of questions what do you want to see on twitter so here you have to select what kind of things actually even before going to this it gives a very high level uh, selection do you want music entertainment sports and it asks you to select at least three interest areas so this is to help twitter personalize personalize the feed for you basically fine tuning the recommendation that twitter gives to you now having selected that it goes to the next step within each of those sections it asks you for finer details suppose you have selected science it asks you further questions what sort of top sub topics within science would you like is it weather space physics astronauts chemistry and similarly business and finance and so on so you can see what is happening twitter is trying to collect explicitly information about your preferences and these preferences are then used to customize your feed that is to say the cust customize the recommendations that are presented to you this is what we call as the knowledge based way of recommending items to customers now in most platforms today uh, they don't use exclusively one approach typically they will use a combination of all three approaches because uh, none of these approaches is perfect each one has its pros and cons and uh, a real a practical solution would be a hybrid of these three and when you try to make a hybrid system there are many ways of doing it either you build independent models and then get independent predictions from them and then you try to combine using some sort of a weighted average you try to combine and make a common prediction or you build a more complex model which integrates all these three approaches into a single model so in industry Uh, there are different ways in which try people try to combine these approaches into a hybrid model before we move on a quick look at the pros and cons of each of these so like i said content based uh, you know it can recommend uh, you don't need to care about other users right if you are new to the platform yes based on you may consume only two or three items from the platform immediately the system understands what kind of items you like because it's all content based the thing is you need metadata that is where domain knowledge is needed for example what is metadata what is domain knowledge suppose we are talking about matrix as a movie somebody should know that matrix is an action movie there is very little comedy in it for example there is some romance in it so that is what we mean by domain knowledge so there should be some idea about the domain and uh, how to accurately create the metadata for that content but that doesn't mean that content base is difficult to implement today there are algorithms which autom automatically derive these things so for example you might use thing something like topic modeling to figure out uh, rough contents or you might use some sort of a classification system 
so you can train models to generate automatically generate uh, metadata for every bit of content which is published on the platform collaborative filtering has its own problems one of the problem for collaborative is cold start suppose i am a new user to the system and i have watched only one or two two videos that is not enough for the system to start recommending anything to me it's a problem because you don't have the system doesn't have enough information about the user to start recommending second thing with collaborative filtering is uh, sparsity so you have lots of users and lots of items so if you uh, draw a matrix between users and items you will find that uh, most users have watched only a small number of items on the platform and even then even those items they have not really given any feedback so the matrix that is uh, cross between uh, users and items is very sparsely populated so that creates a challenge for collaborative filtering to derive the you know latent features so the idea of collaborative filtering is to track the user behavior what kind of uh, items or content they are watching and how they rate that content and using that information that interaction information collaborative filtering tries to figure out the latent features so what do i mean by latent features in this case the features are explicit in content base you say clearly how much comedy is there in a movie how much uh, violence is there in a movie how much uh, action is there how much uh, you know romance is there so all that are so those are all features which can be rated uh, on which the movie can be rated but here no explicit features are defined up front so the features are latent features which are discovered through collaborative filtering but for that one of the challenges is of course sparsity which you know the model has to deal with the knowledge based of course you have the problem of collecting this information from the users if the user doesn't bother to provide accurate information then obviously you know you won't get uh, the right kind of recommendations for that user and the other thing is you are explicitly collecting information from users so there are obviously concerns about privacy okay so these are the broad approaches traditionally uh, and even today these are the approaches which are being used but if you look at the algorithms itself you know how these are implemented in industry uh, uh, previously you know when people used to do collaborative filtering they came up with an approach called matrix factorization uh, unfortunately we don't have time to go into that but matrix factorization was a approach which uh, came about uh, maybe 2005 or so, around that time frame or a little later than that and with so that uh, that kind of an approach was uh, like around for nearly 10 years right up to 2015 or even later than that and even today people still use matrix factorization to, uh, to do collaborative uh, filtering but then uh, those of you who are following what is happening in the machine learning space you will recall that 2012 something happened right alex net uh, cracked the image net uh, image net competition and the deep learning suddenly became popular so from 2012 itself the history of machine learning is very different uh, everybody started adopting deep learning approaches to solving their machine learning problems and this also happened with the recommendation systems so sometime maybe around 2017 people started adopting more and more deep learning approaches into uh, recommendation systems and a little later uh, people also started using so when it comes to deep learning different kinds of networks people have tried it can be rnn cnn uh, uh, our uh, usual feed forward networks so different types of network architectures people have tried but beyond that uh, a little later people started trying out auto encoders but generally so far auto encoders have not been very popular in recommendation systems so people are still using deep learning uh, deep neural networks because they feel that that gives them more flexibility uh, because there are a lot of features you can add there are different network ar architectures you can play with so uh, 
and also probably because uh, there is more expertise out there with uh, deep neural networks so right now those are more popular than uh, uh, auto encoders but people are still researching on auto encoders for recommendation systems then in the last 2 3 years what has become more popular or what is uh, being researched i would say is the use of reinforcement learning in recommendation systems so that is one of the important research areas which people are working on but in general uh, if i have to summarize uh, there are two things which uh, people have observed and i don't think this is exclusive to recommendation systems it is uh, applicable for other systems also one is that the quality of your data so if your data quality is not good obviously the recommendations will not be good so there is uh, sufficient research going on uh, in twitter in uh, and in other companies as well on the quality of the data the second aspect is metrics see your recommendation algorithm can be only as good as the metrics if you choose poor metrics that is to say metrics that don't really reflect whether the user is likely to engage with the content then you will obviously get uh, uh, so the business value is lost that means your algorithm might look like it's doing job, but then it is not converting it uh, converting to dollars because people are not engaging with the tweets so that is why it is also important to uh, choose the correct metrics and this is also not a solved problem so people are researching into the right metrics to use for recommendation systems so with this overview uh, before we move on to how twitter is implementing these things we'll take a couple of questions if anyone has any questions so all these you discussed are what has been in practice so far uh, uh, so we are to go into what twitter does right Yes, yes, that is the next thing we are going to cover. OK, OK, we'll wait. Thanks. Yeah. OK, so I think people are keen to know how Twitter is doing it. So let's get into that. So I don't know how many of you read the blog post. Uh, so this is the blog post which announced that Twitter is open sourcing their algorithm. And uh, much of the information comes from this blog post. And then people have gone and looked at the code base. And then they started analyzing the code base and started writing their own uh, opinions about uh, uh, about the code base. So uh, first thing is why did Twitter open source it? Uh, so the claim from Elon Musk is that uh, he wants to bring transparency. That is to say, why some tweets are promoted compared to other tweets? Because this is always a question or always a matter of debate and contention. Why are you promoting far right tweets? Why are you promoting, uh, you know, uh, religious tweets which seem to, you know, uh, offend some communities? So, so to uh, uh, kind of uh, answer these questions, he wanted to bring transparency on how tweets are promoted. But uh, people have been quick to point out that uh, just because the code is open source doesn't mean that. Uh, you know instinctively that uh, which uh, the reasons behind why some tweets are promoted over others. Because although the code is open sourced, the weights and biases which are associated with the machine learning models, they have not been released. Second, training data is not released. How Twitter itself, how this, these models were trained, that training data is not released. Obviously, because they can't release it because of privacy reasons, because all that data is from user, all the all that is user data. And uh, yeah, so these are the things. Uh, then there are some, uh, they, what they call as trust and safety kind of framework within Twitter, which disallows certain tweets because they violate the policies of Twitter. So they will have certain policies and if the tweet matches any of those, violates any of those policies, then those tweets are removed. So that framework is also not open sourced. Why that is not open source? Because they feel that by open sourcing that people will game the system. 
and they will figure out ways how to you know bypass the checks that are uh, done against those policies so that is one reason why they have not uh, open sourced that so uh, apart from these uh, so the bottom line is although the code has been open source it doesn't bring full transparency to how tweets are promoted so the transparency aspect is still missing but having said that there are some aspects which have been open source uh, we will see that uh, shortly and for data scientists like us uh, we can definitely benefit from studying the code and uh, by studying this code it will help us to implement our own recommendation systems in other scenarios so with that introduction let's get to an example uh, not example the architecture that they have shared so this is the architecture or kind of overview of how twitter's recommendation algorithm works so first of all let's uh, look at the scale of the problem there are something like 450 million monthly active users on twitter and uh, from these users we get roughly 500 million tweets per day okay so that is the scale we are talking about and uh, forget about tweets from yesterday or day before yesterday even if you take tweets which have happened today or in the last 24 hours you have to deal with 500 million tweets now from that 500 million tweets you have to select a bunch of tweets when i say bunch what we really mean is a handful of tweets to show on the timeline of twitter for the user so you can see the scale of the problem and the challenge there is now obviously uh, you know you can't feed 500 million tweets into this neural network and ask the neural network to pick the top uh, 20 tweets or top 100 tweets to show as recommended tweets right so no neural network can handle that kind of scale so the typical process a uh, typical pipeline is what we call as the candidate selection that means before you input anything into the neural network already there is a filter here where from 500 million tweets you reduce it to merely 1500 tweets that means what goes into this neural network which is basically a ranking algorithm what goes into this is only 1500 tweets so a bulk of the operation happens here that means from 500 million tweets it is reduced to 1500 tweets so this is an important part of the pipeline once you get to 1500 tweets then this does the ranking so this is a neural network which has been trained and this ranks you know which are which out of the 1500 it gives a score for each of these tweets on various parameters in fact each tweet gets 10 different labels and these labels are then uh, weight uh, combined in a weighted manner so we will also look at those weights shortly then having done the ranking now you cannot simply show those uh, top 10 or top 20 tweets to the user as recommended tweets so it goes through a bunch of heuristics and filtering so why is this important so for example author diversity you don't want to show like uh, uh, five tweets from the same author so that can also become boring to the user so you want to diversify a little bit show tweets from different authors uh, you know but all of them are still useful tweets which can be recommended to the user then social proof what is social proof so let's say i am following you know 100 users whether those 100 users have interacted with that tweet in any way either they have retweeted it or commented on it or liked the tweet so that is social proof that means somebody in my network has a positive uh, experience with that tweet so that is a social proof so i will use that to recommend that tweet right so like this different uh, heuristics are used as the final uh, uh, filtering then it goes to the last stage which is called mixing so at this stage it is very simple you have a bunch of tweets which have been recommended to you then this is combined with other information for example ads and who to follow now these two by themselves are also coming from recommendations which 
you know are not uh, disclosed uh, in the open source code but we can imagine that uh, these kind of algorithms are also similar to what we have here so this one focuses mainly on the for you timeline that is the kind of home timeline for the user but that is mixed with ads and who to follow which themselves are also recommendations coming from other algorithms which we expect to be similar to this okay so this is the overview of how the twitter's recommendation system works now we will look at this part where you know how the candidates are sourced that is to say how did we get this 1500 tweets from 500 million tweets so broadly there are two categories one is called in network tweets and the other is called out of network tweets so these two boxes that you see here embedding space and social graph those two combined uh, they are what is known as out of network tweets and conceptually they are easy to understand in network tweets are nothing more than people i follow so let's say there are 100 users i follow so then this in network tweet is basically picking out tweets from those users and that goes into the ranking algorithm out of network is tweets uh, from people i am not following so maybe joe biden i don't follow but maybe the algorithm figures out that i might be interested in a tweet by joe biden just because today there are a lot of tweets coming where joe biden may be tagging uh, narendra modi right so the algorithm might suggest to me you know follow this particular tweet from joe biden even though joe biden is not a person i follow in my network but in my network i might be following modi so automatically through this algorithm i might be recommended a tweet by modi but from out of space uh, out of network uh, algorithms i might be recommended a tweet by joe biden because of other factors uh, or because of what is happening right now so that tweet gets uh, recommended to me right so two category in network and out of network uh, categories are recommended now twitter says that on average 50% of the recommended tweets come from in network and the other 50% come from embedding uh, come from out of network so that is the kind of balance they maintain now there are many algorithms or techniques that power how this candidate selection works uh, so some of these uh, are like sim clusters twin real graph so we can't go into the details of this but broadly uh, briefly i will cover what these are so if you take real uh, graph for example uh, it is basically uh, kind of uh, what do you say it it is measuring the likelihood of engagement between a user and an author so let's say uh, you know an author has somebody has posted a tweet and i have a certain relationship with that author who posted the tweet now this real graph uh, encodes that relationship between me and the other uh, users in the system who are uh, posting tweets and it calculates the likelihood that i will engage with that tweet so a real graph is the one that powers this in network uh, recommendations okay so uh, that is what and uh, there is nothing fancy going on here it is nothing more than a logistic uh, regression approach so that is what is being done in in network uh, candidate source embedding space is another uh, okay before embedding space let's go to the older uh, approach called social graph so social graph has been around for a long time right many networks use it including uh, facebook so social graph is again uh, easy to understand so you represent the entire network as a graph where the nodes of the graph are users and tweets right so here there is a difference between real graph and social graph in real graph we are modeling only the users and we are calculating the likelihood that one user will interact with a uh, with a tweet coming from another user so that is real graph but here the network is more generic the nodes of the network encodes both uh, users as well as tweets and the edges of the network 
they encode the kind of interactions you do. So let's say the edge but between one user and another user, that would be follow. That is, I am following another user. Or the edge between a user and a tweet. So that will encode the interactions. So what kind of interactions? Liking the tweet or retweeting it or clicking a link which is embedded in the tweet. That is also an interaction or simply opening the tweet and staying on the tweet for a certain time. So all those are interactions which can be encoded. So that is uh, what is known as social graph and uh, there is a framework within Twitter that powers this. So this framework is called the GraphJet framework. So a paper was published on GraphJet. Uh, that paper is from 2016. So those of you who are interested, you can study that paper. So the GraphJet framework uh, powers the social graph. And the GraphJet framework itself, uh, you know, it's an evolution of an earlier framework called WTF. So WTF stands for who to follow. Let me write it down. So the earlier framework was called uh, WTF and the GraphJet framework derives from this. So WTF stands for who to follow. Now this was uh, limited in scope. This earlier framework was limited in scope because it can only recommend users who, who you can follow. GraphJet framework is more uh, generic because it can not only recommend who to follow, but it can also recommend what kind of tweets you can uh, that can be recommended to the user. So uh, this is a generalization of the earlier framework called uh, who to follow. So that's about the GraphJet uh, and the social graph. The more common use uh, approach today is the embedding space which uh, those of you who are coming from NLP, you would have heard things like word to vec, glove. Those are all embeddings for words in the NLP space. Similar thing is there here as well uh, in, in recommendation system. But here, what are we embedding? We are embedding basically tweets and user information. That means every user in the system is represented in a vector space, a point on the vector space. Similarly, every tweet in the system is represented in the same vector space. Now what this gives us two vectors which are very close together in the vector space are alike. They can be users or they can be tweets, right? Doesn't matter. Two points which are close together in the vector space are said to be uh, like if you calculate the cosine similarity, you will find that it results in a high uh, score. And what are the things that uh, power this embedding space? What are uh, so there are two things. One is called sync clusters. The other is called uh, twin. So twin stands for Twitter heterogeneous uh, something network. Uh, so let's look at the sync clusters because that is useful to see. And this is also mentioned in the blog post. So according to the blog post, you know, Twitter looks at the kind of tweets that are coming out and does some sort of a classification. And I mean classification in the sense in the vector space, it look like, it calculates the similarity across tweets and across users. And then it forms what is known as sim clusters or communities. So if you take this as an example, you have here uh, Jennifer Lopez, Selena Gomez, Rihanna, and all these people, they form a cluster called POP. And this cluster has 332 million, I think, users or, yeah, users, yeah. User, yeah, I'm not sure, users or tweets. Then here you have another cluster, news cluster, NBA cluster, soccer cluster, Bollywood cluster, and so on. So now if for example, uh, you know, I like a lot of, uh, let's say, Bollywood. I like a lot. I am following Bipasha Basu, let's assume, as an example. Right? And then somebody else in the same cluster is tweeting. And although this person is not in my network, let's say so this person is uh, Sushmita Sen. I am not following this person. I am following Bipasha Basu. So, the Twitter network knows my preference. 
but I am not following Sush Sushmisa Sin. Right. So this is an out of network user. But then because both of them belong to the same cluster. Twitter, uh, so, so this SIM cluster, because of the SIM cluster, Twitter now recognizes that in the vector space, these two are similar. And because of this, I will now be recommended tweets from Sus Sushmita Sen, even though she is out of my network. So that is the whole point about uh, this, what we saw here, right? SIM clusters is one of the ways in which uh, you know, you recommend out of network tweets to the user. And this twin is uh, something similar. Uh, it is also uh, kind of related to, so it, it, it has its own way of doing things. Basically, uh, it encodes, uh, I don't know if I have a graph of that. Yeah, twin is, yeah, it is something like this, yeah. You can see here twin graph pre-training and then downstream tasks. So you have a bunch of nodes. Again, it's a graph problem. You have a bunch of users, advertisers, ads, tweets. All these are encoded in a graph. And then the relationship between all this are already available to you and they come from a database. So there is nothing to discover here. The database already contains all the interactions between all these uh, nodes in the network. So this forms what is known as a twin graph. And then this uh, creates an embedding for you. So you get the embedding vector for users as well as tweets. So now you might be wondering what is the relationship between this and SIM clusters? See, even in case of SIM clusters, somewhere you have to learn these embeddings. So these embeddings can be learned using the twin graph. So from the twin graphs, which is basically the input of all the interactions that happen in the system, you can, uh, so the output will be the embeddings. This embeddings will help you then to identify the SIM clusters. Then these clusters can then be used for downstream tasks, whatever the task may be. And today we are using it for recommendation. So this is how overall it works in Twitter. Any questions before we look at the code? So all this is described here. If uh, you found it hard to understand it from here, I simply explained it uh, to you. Now we can look at the code. So there are two parts which have been open sourced. One is the pipeline itself, the algorithm. The other is the machine learning models. So now if you look at this, the machine learning model is exclusively written in Python. So this entire code base is in Python. If you look at the other one, the uh, overall uh, Twitter's recommendation algorithm, this is implemented in Scala and Java. They are the main uh, languages in which these have been implemented. Now, this is a bit of a challenge for me because I don't know Scala, so it was difficult for me to follow this piece of code, although I got some idea. But uh, I am more familiar with Python, so I started looking at this, uh, this code first. And I think uh, many of us will be interested in the machine learning aspect uh, more than this aspect. This is also important. So let's look at the machine learning code first. Uh, so if I have to look at the structure here. So the first thing is the code is organized. Uh, like this and uh, see uh, typically for any Python project. First we would need to know what are the dependencies. What are the other packages which the project is using? And we look for something like a requirements file. So this requirements file is embedded inside this uh, folder called images where it has some shell script to create a virtual environment. And then you have this bunch of requirements which by running this shell script, uh, it will install it for you. So a quick look at this. First thing is they use PyTorch. Right, so if you look at this. They use Torch. 
and then other important uh, packages from torch so torch matrix is used and i don't know how many of you have used pytorch especially for recommendation so uh, it so happens that torch has its own uh, package dedicated for recommendations torch rec and uh, obviously to make sense of this you have to look at the documentation so as with any other uh, pytorch module uh, documentation is pretty good so this is the module which uh, has all the components for recommendation systems which is so this is customized for uh, recommendation so you can see here data sets distributed planner inference models modules optimizer so this entire thing is created specifically for recommendation system so this can actually cut down your development time because you don't have to use the more generic uh, pytorch modules to build this so this is kind of customized for uh, recommendation systems so you can uh, look into it then the other thing is for so what i read somewhere is that uh, this code base started with tensorflow so they have some elements of tensorflow here but then later they mig migrated to pytorch and uh, so bulk of the code is uh, in pytorch but uh, you will find that some places they are using tensorflow let's say when manipulating some data sets and so forth so that is why tensorflow is still uh, part of the uh, what do you call the dependencies then obviously for gpu you need uh, some packages which will help you to train this whole thing on gpus so we have nvidia packages so which will help you to uh, use their gpus uh, effectively so these are the main things uh, which i could figure out by looking at these dependencies the other thing is any uh, of these packages if you open it will be imported like this from tml ml logging torch logging right now if you search for tml you will not find it and in fact uh, python will start complaining that it is not able to find this package right so how this is uh, done here in this code so the trick is if you look at the github actions workflow here it will show you how it is done and uh, this is a general note for people trying to understand any open source code if you study how the github actions is implemented very often you will figure out how it is deployed and that can give you a clue you know on uh, some of the problems you might face when understanding the code so if you notice what they do here is they create a temp directory and inside that they create a, a soft link and they name it tml and then they add this to the python path so this becomes the module right so the entire code base is under this uh, package name of uh, tml and that is how they do it here uh, how i have did it in my environment is after doing a clone what i did was i put the entire code repo inside another subfolder and i named it tml and that is good enough for vs code to pick it up so now uh, that is how i use it in this uh, environment right otherwise if it doesn't find there will be a red underline here it will say that uh, you know i can't find this package tml okay so let's see how this whole thing is organized uh, so you can see here tools there's nothing much here in tools reader to read from the data set then you have projects so there are two projects this is the bulk of the code actually home recap so recap i think recommendation something i don't know what what this what the full form is so this is where the recommendation algorithm is this part of the code is for the what we just saw about twin which is uh, trying to figure out the embeddings for the users and the tweets so that code is here and the recommendation engine the main code is under home recap then you have optimizers so any of you so those of us who have worked on other ml projects we can uh, like benefit by looking at the structure right 
So neatly everything is, uh, the code is partitioned into its own, uh, what you call subfolders. So it's easy to understand what is going on where. So optimizers are here, logging is here, metrics are here, machines. So this relates to the deployment. So one of the things is, are you deploying correctly in a virtual environment? If you are not, immediately exit. That means you just uh, say that uh, it's an error. You should not be running this code without a proper virtual environment. So those kind of environment related things are put into this folder. Images, very simple, as I showed you, it is about uh, resolving all the dependencies for this project. Some core modules, which will be used when we are exercising the projects. That is either during inference or when training the machine learning model, these core files will be used. So one of the core files is, for example, custom training loop. Right. So this loop is what will be invoked by the package, which is here, the recommendation. When we are training the algorithm for recommendation, it will use the core modules from here. Then there are some common files like file system related checkpointing. Right. Now you might say, why do we need this? Why can't we put it inside code? Yeah, that's a design choice. So there might be a reason why they might have done like this. So that is something for us to study. So now if you look at this, let's look at the readme. We can also see this online. It might be easier. So let's go back to the code base, ML code base. So we have been looking. So this is the readme, top readme. Now we are looking at, uh, let's say, projects. And under projects, home recap. And if you look at this readme, you will see here a number of things that are happening here. So this is worth looking at. Right? So I told you earlier, what does this recommendation do? This is nothing but the heavy ranker, which is which is what which is this guy, right? We are looking at this part of the neural this neural network, which takes in thousand five hundred tweets and then gives a score to each tweet. Now this score is not initially a single value. The score is actually ten different values, as you can see here. That is. 10, uh, yeah, 10 different features, you can call it. For each feature, a score is given. That is, let's look at the 10 features. The probability that the user will favorite the tweet. Probability the user will retweet it. Probability user replies to the tweet. So like this, 10 different features are defined. And for each of these features, this probability score will be calculated by the neural network for each tweet. Now that has to be translated to a single value, and that is where a weighted average is taken. Now, obviously, we need to know what are the weights. Now, here, uh, Twitter has not been secretive. For some reason, they have been open, been open about it. They have published the weights, how these different values are combined. So you can see that uh, if you favorite something, you get a weightage of 0.5. But retweeting is a very good thing, so you get a higher weight. But then if somebody replies to a tweet, that is even a stronger signal. So that gets a weight that is 13 times higher than retweeting. So that means this gives us an idea. Whenever you reply to a tweet, that is a positive reinforcement signal to the algorithm. Likewise, you look at uh, this. Suppose you report a tweet then that get, gets a very highly negative score. Or for that matter, if you give a negative feedback, that also gives a very negative score, minus 74. So as users, we can also benefit from this. That means, suppose I like, uh, I don't know, let's say I like Bollywood movies, and for some reason, uh, you know, Twitter recommended me a Hollywood movie. But I don't like Hollywood. So I gave a negative feedback. This becomes a very important signal to Twitter. That means in future, Hollywood movies will not be recommended to me because of this signal. 
So this goes back as a feedback uh, to the algorithm. Right, so these are uh, these are the uh, weights which are then used. Uh, look at the 75, very strong signal, right? Reply engaged by author. So let's look at this. The probability the user replies to the tweet and this reply is engaged by the tweet author. So that means there is an active conversation going between. I mean, this is what the algorithm predicts. Suppose I reply to a tweet by Modi. And this will also calculate what is the probability that Modi will reply to my tweet that is engaged with my tweet. He may like my tweet and so on. So this gives a very high score. So that is why the weight is very heavy, 75 and so on. Now this is adjusted all the time. This is not, these are not static numbers. Right when it was first published, the numbers were like this. When first Twitter open sourced it, the numbers were something like this. Today it might have changed a little bit. Right. So yeah, right now here, take a look at this 11 and 10. Yeah, these numbers are same, but I think when they first open sourced it, uh, the numbers were different. Then on April 5th, they changed, adjusted the numbers. So they say that these numbers are uh, adjusted all the time based on retraining of the neural networks and other other parameters. OK, so this is a thing to note and the rest of the algorithm can be studied in, inside this. Okay. So before we move on, any questions? So these are the main things I wanted to cover. Any questions? Uh, thus far and based on the questions we can dig deeper if required. OK, no questions. Uh, someone has raised their hand. Go ahead if you have a question. Uh, yes, I uh, wanted to understand that uh, these weights that are given, is it uh, coming from the model or this one is uh, at the beginning when the, uh, like, is it feeded at the beginning as well, like before it is being trained? Uh, so these uh, weights are calculated elsewhere. How these are calculated is not shared by Twitter. Okay, so okay, that so means these weights are applied uh, here. At this point, once you get the output from the Ranker neural network, these weights are applied. Okay. But how these weights are cal calculated are not released by uh, Twitter. OK, but it could be possible that at the beginning they had they could have maybe uh, given the these weights from there and like for tweaking purpose from the tweaking yeah, these weights are fixed in the sense that mm -hmm. when this algorithm runs it is already fixed but okay. once in a while when they say once in a while it may be once in two weeks or once a week they may adjust mm -hmm. the weights okay 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 yeah and that might depend on many other factors say they may use signals from real graph or sim clusters and so on to adjust the weights and it okay. might also be based on some things from the trust and safety, which they have not open source. So these are some of the things which people have questioned. So although to some extent, I mean, although they have open sourced the code, it is not fully transparent. We don't know how these weights are calculated, for example. But at least it is uh, better than not sharing the weights. Mm -hmm. Correct, correct. Got it. Thank you. So. Did you train the algorithm or? Is it so trainable? You see, we, we cannot train it uh, the way Twitter has trained it for the simple reason that they have not shared the training data. Data is okay. not available. Yes. Yeah, but they have given uh, random data or they have given a script which generates a random data for us. I think that is uh, okay. mentioned somewhere here. Just hold on. You can see here. Home recap scripts create random data. Okay. I will open that file. It's a shell. Home script. recap script create random data. 
So they have a simple script here, which will uh, create the random data for you, and then you can use this data to train. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that is first thing. Now, second thing is there is, uh, so that is as far as recommendation goes. But what about this algorithm, twin algorithm? There is a readme for this as well. So this code contains code for pre-training dense vector embedding features for Twitter entities. So when we say entities, we mean embeddings for users as well as tweet. So diagram also. Now, is there a way for us to train our own? Um, what do you call? Uh, can we use this model to train our own embeddings? The answer is yes, because this data is available on Hugging Face. If you go to Hugging Face here, the training data, which is basically nothing but our network. See, earlier I talked about this twin network. Let's mm -hmm. go back to this diagram. This is our twin network, which captures the relationship between users and tweets, users and ads, and so on. This graph is captured here in this data set. Twitter follow graph. Okay. Twitter follow graph is author to user to author. So if you see user to author, it is this yellow to yellow. Okay. Right. Then there is another equivalent graph which is also shared, and that is this one, which is Twitter favorite graph. That means as a user, I have liked a particular tweet. Mm. Yeah. Right. And yeah. this data is enhanced by the fact that they also capture a timestamp. How much time? Not timestamp. Time chunk. Uh, you have to understand the data state to figure out okay. what it means. Right. OK, so now these two uh, data sets can be used now to train this algorithm. So here you don't need any random uh, synthetic data to be generated. You can use this data. But only thing is, I assume that this has been anonymized, kind of. We don't mm. know who the actual user is, right? It is just okay. a number. Mm. We don't know which is the actual tweet. It is just a number. So, so this data can then be used to train uh, the twin algorithm and uh, yeah, get the embeddings out of it. And then those okay. embeddings you can use to you can use in this algorithm when you do the ranking. OK, OK, got it. So they have open sourced it for public uh, to create a perception, looks like. Yeah, but this one, I don't know how old is this data set. Uh, see, this data set might be older than that. See, this is linked to this paper 2210. And okay. this paper is itself not a new paper. It's a let me see if I have this paper. Two two with one zero. Two two one zero. Yep. Okay. So this is uh, yeah. One this year is old. Uh, yeah, October twenty twenty two. So even before they open sourced it uh, two three months back, this data set was available. Okay. Interesting. Thanks. Any further questions? So I don't know how many of you are completely new to. OK, Priyanjali, go ahead. Uh, hi, actually, so I had one more doubt in embedding matching. Uh, this uh, Twitter tweet index, user index, are these like the, uh, these are the features that are being converted into embeddings and uh, what are they? Uh, doing that cosine similarity with like, is it with the actual Twitter tweet and its attribute or I mean, sorry, is it with the topic? Like what are they matching it with? So uh, first, uh, your first part of the question, is it related to this data? You are asking about this index and all that. Uh, so like how exactly the embedding match is done? Like, yeah, this has nothing to do. This is just an identity for the user and the tweet. This has okay. nothing to do with the embedding. Correct. This is just the index right? value. This is simply to encode the graph relationship, which we showed okay. in this figure. 
This um, only encodes these arrows, these, this arrow from user to tweet, this arrow from user to user. So this indicates that user one is following user two. This indicates that user one has favorited tweet seven. Hmm. Right? So hmm. this network captures this. Okay. From this graph, you generate using that uh, twin algorithm or uh, from this graph, hmm. you have a uh, algorithm to generate the embeddings for you, right? So okay. this okay. algorithm might be as simple as uh, matrix factorization. To understand matrix factorization, I spoke about matrix factorization okay. earlier, right? Okay. So that there are enough papers out there or videos to explain what it is. Okay. Okay. So from that, you will be able to get the embeddings. Uh, now okay. these embeddings may be as big as, let's say, 50 dimensions or 100 dimensions. Mm -hmm. So basically, what, what does that 100 dimension represent? It means that you are talking about 100 different features. Right. But uh, we don't know means... what those features are. Like they are all latent mm -hmm. features. You cannot give a name mm -hmm. to that feature saying that this feature mm -hmm. is comedy, this feature is horror, mm -hmm. this is romance, this is action. You cannot give any name to those features. You can only say that these are latent features which the model has captured, which the embedding has captured. Yeah. So then yeah. now for each user, you get a hundred dimension vector. Each tweet, you get a hundred dimension vector. On these, you do the cosine similarity to find out whether they are similar or dissimilar. And that is where the sim clusters get formed. Okay, I got it now. Okay, okay. So it's like from the first they create the graph, and from the graph they create this matrix using that matrix uh, factorization, and then you get this embedding size of 100, 200, and they do this um, cosine similarity. Let's say one first user to another third tweet, which is from us, user 10 or so, and they yeah, yeah. find the closest match. Yeah. And that's so the they... idea is like that, uh, but I'll tell you actually what they use to get the sim clusters. They mm -hmm. use what is known as approximate uh, nearest neighbor. See, most of us are familiar mm -hmm. with KNN, K nearest neighbors. Right? Okay, but I have heard approximate as well. I think Microsoft yeah. also. also they... yeah. Yes, please. So the me. problem with K nearest neighbors is uh, yeah, it tries to capture the K nearest, uh, like, it is more computationally intensive because it tries to get the best uh, nearest neighbors. But when we are dealing with the scale at which Twitter is dealing with, we cannot use K nearest neighbors. So we need a much more leaner algorithm which runs really fast and we can sacrifice a little bit of accuracy. So that mm -hmm. is where they use something called approximate nearest neighbor algorithm. where out. So that is how the SIM clusters are generated. Okay, if it's possible, can you, uh, if it's not a waste of time, like, can you tell me a bit on uh, ANN? Like I, I've heard this, I will look into this more. Uh, what is your question? Which is the paper on ANN? Ha, ha, ha. Oh. Okay, I will put it in the YouTube description. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. So you are saying that um, with this, along with this embedding match, they also do ANN for finding the nearest. Yeah, not part of this algorithm, but hmm. from this embeddings, when you have to make the SIM clusters, that is where hmm. ANN is being used. Okay. Now, okay. since you asked that, see, that is not part of this because it's actually probably not a machine learning thing, right? Hmm. Uh -huh. There is not, uh, there is no neural network involved there. So uh -huh. let's go back to our, uh, see, we were looking so far at this code source but there is another open source code okay. called the algorithm. So mm -hmm. this is where the SIM clusters code is there. Can you see here, SIM mm -hmm. cluster ANN? Yes, yes, SIM clusters ANN, correct. Right, this is what you should be looking at if you are interested in ANN and how SIM clusters are formed, right? Okay. But the input mm -hmm. to this is embeddings and these embeddings come from the other, as I showed you, from the twin mm -hmm. over here. Mm -hmm. So those embeddings come from this project where we have mm. this model, twin model. Mm. And this embeddings then go as an input to SIM clusters in this repo for ANN. Okay. And do you think like these mod, these uh, 
i mean these algorithms are also used let's say if you want to do search like search on words or so like and you want to match it with the nearest topic yeah yeah definitely you see uh, see we have only looked at and let me open my my own twitter see i don't have a twitter account but we have a devopedia twitter account okay so in devopedia in devopedia so let's say explore and uh, for you see this is the timeline we have been looking at okay hmm yes right whatever we are talking about recommending tweets to users it is coming from here we are talking about how this feed is populated but like this there are so many other recommendations on twitter for example who to follow this is also another recommendation model hmm yes, yes what kind of ads are served that is another recommendation model correct right what is trending so oh, now wow. this now it has figured out that out of see there if i am accessing it as a us citizen from the us i might be getting us trends not india trends yeah so the, so for every part of twitter there is a different algorithm happening hmm. but many of the algorithm may share some of the things like embeddings they may share sim clusters they may share hmm. right so some parts will be shared but then finally the algorithm that do the ranking before it appears on the ui that will be different correct yes right now yes. the thing is who to follow i don't know you have to check the code source what i mm -hmm. read was that that has not been shared that algorithm mm -hmm. is not part of this code source but uh, yeah you have to look into it whether it is there anywhere okay okay thanks thanks arvind any other questions so if you are new to uh, recommendation systems yeah it uh, what i would say is it looks very interesting it has huge scope and if you think about it uh, actually a recommendation system uh, in computer science it is classified as a subdomain of information retrieval so what is information retrieval you give a query and then it gives you a list of matches what you do on google search is nothing but information retrieval right and uh, in fact uh, this uh, so called uh, recommendation system started purely as a information retrieval system and then practically it became so important because there are so many real world systems which are using which are recommending content to you their users on their platforms so over time recommendation systems have become very specialized and now they are a subdomain on their own and lot of research is going on in this field uh, it is far from a solved problem to give you a feel of that i can show you some of the papers which are being published recently so these are all uh, papers recently published reducing popularity bias right fairness a survey on fairness of recommender systems so that is another thing what is this one this one is reinforcement learning so i talked about reinforce uh, in the introduction i told how people are trying to use reinforcement learning for recommender systems this is one of the papers right very new paper may 2023 then there is a subclass of recommender systems called sequential recommender systems what are these so this is also easy to understand suppose i am on amazon.com and i am purchasing things let's say i bought a new uh, new uh, let's say i am doing this uh, online webinars so i bought a new sound recording system like a microphone system then i bought led lights then i bought a table then i bought a laptop now amazon knows from my sequence of purchases or what has been added to the shopping cart it knows that now i am likely to purchase a chair i am likely to purchase a web camera right why because it has looked at the sequence of purchases i have made 
So based on that sequence, recommended systems can recommend the correct thing for the user. So what is special about sequential recommender system is it also encodes the time component. What are you purchasing and the sequence in which you are purchasing? So that time component is also going into going is being considered as one of the inputs to recommender systems. So that is another area of research. Choosing the right weights. Well, uh, OK, then uh, graph neural networks. Multitask learning. That is also important. Multitask learning. Uh, yeah. Curse of low dimensionality. <laughs> this is also an interesting title. Normally we talk about high dim dimensionality because if you have a high dimension. It uh, prevents you from scaling up. Right, so scalability becomes a problem. So that is the case with Twitter. You have 400 million monthly active users. You have 500 million tweets coming in every day. You multiply the two, you have a huge matrix. So that's a high, uh, that's a scale scalability problem. You you are dealing with uh, high dimensions. But here, what is meant by low dimension is remember we talked about embeddings. We are calculating the embeddings for users and tweets. So the, now the question arises: How many dimensions should you have in the embeddings? So this paper talks about the fact gives us some sense that if you choose very low dimension. Your actually your recommendation systems actually will perform poorer. So they compared 128 dimensions, 256 dimensions, as well as 64 dimension vectors. So they found that 256 dimensional vectors perform much better. Now, what kind of dimensions are used in Twitter? We don't know. So that is uh, well, I don't know. I, I wouldn't say we don't know. I, I don't know that. But if you study the twin code, that should uh, give you some insight into what kind of. Uh, see, this is the twin code, right? This is the twin code. You have a config here, local YAML. So this is a standard structure for machine learning models, right? You have a config file. You have a data file, which also has some test related stuff. And then you have something called so, so the model modeling is done here, then some scripts. So normally we will start understanding the code by looking at the model file here. I mean the structure of the model. So you can see here how training is done, how many steps, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So now here anything is relates to embedding dimensions. So it says embedding dimensions for I don't know what it means. Number of embed embeddings 424, 241. I don't know what it means. So you have to go through the code to figure out what it means. But if it says that embedding dimension is only four, then that is very poor, right? I don't know how you can get good uh, results from that. So this is what this paper is about. If you have a very low dimension in your embedding vectors, then your results are not likely to be very good. And then uh, last paper again, I think, uh, yeah. All sorts of deep learning techniques are being used. So this paper is a summary of different deep learning techniques. But this is not such a good paper. There are much better papers compared to this. OK, any questions before we log off? OK, thanks for joining. Uh, so we'll log off here. So look out for our uh, next event. And if any of you uh, want to present or speak in your own areas of expertise, do contact us. The OPD is an open platform. You can talk about your areas of interest, what you are working on. You don't need to be an expert, but if you know the topic sufficiently enough, you can talk about what you know and then uh, we can engage in a discussion. Right, so you can also become a speaker on this forum. Talks generally are one hour. And some time can be assigned for Q&A.
Okay, thanks guys. Have a nice weekend. Thank you so much. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Welcome.